Today, I want to talk about testing and build systems. More specifically, I will explain what testing is, along with some motivation for having tests. Follow that up by talking about the basics of continuous integration build systems, and finally wrap up the video by giving you some advice related to testing and build systems in your first job as a software engineer. This is the fourth video in the series on applied software engineering, but the third one that talks about the proverbial tools of the trade and processes that are widely used across the software engineering industry today. This video is intended for an audience that is interested in finding out more about the software engineering profession but has little experience in the industry. Alright, I think that's all that you need to know before we begin, so let's get to it. Before we can actually begin talking about the more exciting topics like continuous integration and build systems, we have to talk about testing. Testing is an incredibly important topic in software engineering, especially if you're trying to create software of very high quality. The topic doesn't even have to be boring, so let me first motivate the need for tests. When you write some code, no matter how simple, you'll likely have introduced some small error that will be difficult to catch. The only way to verify that the code actually does what you expected is to test it out. If you wrote the code in a compiled language, then the very first test you do is see if what you wrote even compiles. That's already a test. Next, regardless of the type of language, you probably want to verify further and run the code manually. This is the second test, and it's more involved. However, if you're a software engineer working in an established team or company, then such manual tests are likely not going to be accepted, and you will need to add some automated tests. Before we go any further into types of tests, test hierarchies, and more, I simply have to explain why the entire industry has such a love for automated tests, even if they aren't fun to write. You know what's even less fun than writing tests? Dealing with a bug that a customer of your software has found that could have easily been caught by an automated test. Essentially, if the code you added passes all the tests, that's amazing, you now have the confidence to deploy your code. If your code does not pass tests, that's even more amazing, you caught the issues before the customer caught them for you. The confidence of knowing that at least all your tests are passing is really nice to help you sleep at night. Alright, now that you understand why tests matter, I need to get back to the different types of tests and test hierarchies, beginning with types of tests. There are typically three types of tests that are called different things in different environments. For simplicity, I will call them unit tests, smoke tests, and product tests, even though the technical terminology may differ slightly. Unit tests are tests that ensure that the basic functionality that you have within your component works as expected. These are often self-contained and take very little time to run. Next are the smoke tests, and I believe that the name is derived from the phrase smoke and mirrors. Essentially, a smoke test will integrate multiple components together, but will typically not spin up the entire system within which it resides. The functionality of the other unrelated parts of the code base will be simulated in some way, hence the smoke and mirrors. And now let's move on to the last type of tests, product tests. This is the type of test that stands the entire system up and makes sure that the product works as intended in concert with all the features and components running within it. If you're making a mobile app, it's likely that this test will run on actual devices. If it's a web project, this sort of testing is likely to be a full UI test. Now, there are more types of tests sometimes even with large teams that actively try to break your code. But what I discussed so far should cover 90 to 95% of the tests that you're likely to encounter as a software engineer. Also, testing is a somewhat contentious topic with a lot of debate on what sort of testing is best for what sort of product, but that's not a topic for this video. Taking a step back, I need to briefly talk about testing hierarchies. The main idea here is where in the build, merge and release cycle of software, each type of test should run. The typical idea is that your unit test should be fast enough to run locally and during every single build. Your smoke tests should be fast enough to be able to run them as part of your pull request. Now, when it comes to product tests, it will most likely depend on your workplace how often they run. Typically, some subset of product tests will run as part of your pull request, but all of them will run periodically against your mainline branch to make sure that what you have in the mainline branch is working. As you could hear from what I just said, you can't talk about testing without talking about build systems, so let's talk about that next. Just like it becomes difficult to talk about testing without discussing build systems, it is also difficult to talk about build systems without discussing continuous integration systems. However, everything will be discussed in due time, so let's not get ahead of ourselves. I will start by talking about build systems and only then get to the more complicated topics. The first thing I have to say about build systems is actually a misconception about builds. A build does not necessarily mean that the code you are building has to be written in a compiled language. This is because build systems put together and verify entire software components and not just compile the package. 
This misconception usually stems from the fact that in university, the only time you really encounter build systems is the Linux make utility within the context of the class on C programming. Builds, however, do much more than just compile the programs. A build is a set of steps that packages the software together in a way that is either usable as a single unit or is distributable to be used by other software. In addition, builds quite often also verify that the software roughly does what it's set out to do, but this is not an absolute necessity of a build process. So now that you understand what a build is, a build system is simply the software system that facilitates builds. Quite often, a build system is directed by some build file, with one of the better known such build files being the make file, which directs the make build system. Other build systems that you may encounter over your career are Ninja, Bazel, and Gradle. There can also be higher level build systems that put together many different individual software units somewhat efficiently. As an example, if someone made a change in a package that you do not care about, your package does not need to be rebuilt. However, if a dependency of yours has been updated, then your package should be built alongside the dependency to verify that everything still works as intended in your package. This process of only building what has changed is called an incremental build and is a common feature in all good build systems. Now that you understand what a build system is, you may be wondering why I said multiple times that it's difficult to talk about tests without talking about builds and about builds without tests. Well, the reason is that builds are a good way to put software together and verify that it works. And the best way to verify that software works is to test it. Therefore, as mentioned, a large subset of your tests and most likely all your unit tests should run as part of a build. After all, if any step in the build fails, then the software is not ready to be used and testing often becomes just one of those steps in your build. However, I also said that it's difficult to talk about build systems without talking about continuous integration. So what was that bit about? Well, a continuous integration system is essentially a loop that keeps running builds off your software product over and over for some purpose. Quite often, this purpose is related to verifying that things work as intended in the mainline branch. And the other purpose is to verify that everything in the pull request that some developer is trying to submit works with all the other software you have. The most common place to see continuous integration within a company is specifically during the pull request process. How these work is that the changes that you have in your own branch get merged into a copy of the parent branch, and then all the relevant software packages are rebuilt and all the relevant tests are run. If the continuous integration job passes, then that should be a good sign that your pull request is safe to merge. Now, since there are sometimes gaps in test coverage and bugs may slip through, continuous integration jobs keep perpetually running against the mainline branch to verify that everything still works the way that you expect it to. If you're interested in learning more about this topic, then I suggest that you look into continuous deployment and continuous delivery. I will not discuss these topics in this video as each topic is actually rather deep, but you should know of their existence in your job as a software developer. Well, with that said, I think that's all I wanted to say about build systems. So now is about as good of a time as any to move on and provide you with some advice on testing and build systems. A good chunk of the advice I'm about to provide is just suggestions on how to orient yourself within your new work environment that any software engineer with some experience should already know. But other advice is something I only came to realize later and I don't know if everyone really knows already. Therefore, let's begin with the absolute basics. At any new job, the first thing that you should learn is how to actually build your project locally. Quite often, you wouldn't need to build the entire system, but rather just your package. This is something that you will do so many times over the course of your job that you should understand the process very well. Learning how to build the project locally will probably involve learning some new command line tools and how they all interface with the source code within some directory. You should also learn how to build not just your own package, but also the packages that depend on your code, just to know how to get everything in a consistent state for testing later on. Speaking of tests, the next thing that I would advise you to learn right away is how to both run the entire suite of unit tests for your package and how to run each unit test individually. This is also something that you will do extremely often at your job. So you should learn how to run all the tests without having to run a continuous integration job just to see what failed every time. Now, when I say that you should learn how to run individual tests, I'm not talking about just figuring out how to execute it. If your workplace practices continuous integration, then you likely will encounter feature flags. So you need to know how to run tests with those flags enabled or disabled. In other words, learn what your test infrastructure can do for you early on. The next piece of advice I have for you is to find out what the test hierarchy looks like at your workplace and also to ask when each type of test is executed within the build or merge pipeline. 
this is something that should be explained to you as part of onboarding, so it's definitely something that you should be paying attention to. Now, this next piece of advice is something that I came around to through trial and error. If you're assigned a bug that happened within your software component, do not jump into fixing it right away. Once you understand what the bug is, reproduce it in a test first and only then start looking at actually fixing it. The reason is that if you first fix the bug and then write the test, you likely will not actually be able to properly verify that the fix you wrote solves the bug if you never reproduce it in the test first. If you're able to reproduce the bug in test first, then you have actual proof that this is indeed the bug that was filed, and then you have a test that verifies that it does not happen again. This technique actually comes from test-driven development, or TDD for short. I'll be honest, I'm not the biggest fan of TDD for general development, but I do take some parts from the methodology for personal use. Alright, let's move on to advice relating to flaky tests. A flaky test is a test that occasionally fails for some reason. These flaky tests are a nightmare to have in your code, as they can occasionally fail your builds, forcing you to unnecessarily investigate changes. And then when the flaky test fails for a proper reason, you might actually override it thinking that it's just being flaky. This is a real issue. Therefore, my advice is to do your best to fix flaky tests every time that you encounter them. Not only will this improve the reliability of your build system in general, it'll most likely score you brownie points with the rest of your team too. Let me move on to the last piece of advice I have for you today. I would strongly suggest you spend a day learning the more advanced features and configuration knobs of your build system. I will motivate this advice with an example. Let's say that you made some changes that you know for a fact will break builds. For example, it'll cause every single test to fail everywhere. Such types of changes must be done every once in a while, especially if you're just temporarily verifying that everything compiles after making broad infrastructure changes. This way, you want to find out how to make the build system not run any tests and keep going for as long as it can before failing. There is often a configuration knob somewhere in the build system to let you do that. There are other, extremely specific cases where knowing what the build system can do ahead of time will save you loads of time and effort, so take your time and learn what the build system can do for you. With that out of the way, I don't have much else to say, so let's just wrap up the video instead. In this video, you have gotten a high-level understanding of what testing is, what build systems are, and how the two often tie in together. In addition to that, I gave you some advice regarding what to focus on when learning about the testing infrastructure and build systems you have at your workplace. While a lot of the information I have tried sharing with you here may seem a bit too abstract if you're very new and have never worked in industry, it should still serve as good context for what the tools of the software engineering trade are and a decent reference for when you just begin writing software professionally. Either way, I really hope that this video was helpful and interesting for you. Feel free to check out this playlist here to watch all the videos I have on the topic of applied software engineering, especially if you're watching this in the future when I've already uploaded the whole series. Also, feel free to ask questions if you have any. I try to respond to all the comments I get, and I've made a few videos based on viewer requests so far. Anyway, thank you for your time, bye.